Hallelujah. Thank you, everyone. You may be seated. I'm Pastor Scott. I'm so glad you're here with us this morning. And if you've been here for the well, past couple of months, we have been working our way through, and this will be our final message on our um, Faith, Hope, and Love series. So we started out with, obviously, faith, and that, uh, this whole verse or whole section comes out of 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Faith, hope, and love, Paul says, or really he says, now these three abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And so we wanted to save love, obviously, for the end and talk about it as the greatest. Uh, we did see some of that in the past couple of weeks where we went through those in 1 John, those 12 tests, we actually didn't go through all of them. I hope you're okay that we didn't hit the last three. They're fairly repetitive in the, the way that we covered them. But uh, what we've got is faith, hope, and love is what we're looking at. And so we had those tests. And what I want to make sure that we kind of cover this morning before we even jump into love is that those tests in 1 John, given to us by the apostle, given to us by the Holy Spirit, were never intended to make us feel less than we are. Okay? They were always intended for us to say, I want to know that I know that I know my Savior. And he always wants the very best for us. He always wants us to grow closer to him. He always wants us to take the sin and the shame and the transgressions that we commit all too frequently, and he wants us to put them down and, and allow him to build us up in the faith. And that's what those tests are for. No one should let the devil rob you of your joy and make you think that you're not saved when you make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. But again, John wrote those letters, uh, his first letter there, in order for us to know that we know. And so he gave us this great opportunity to do a self-evaluation. And I hope you did, if you were here for those, I hope you went through that, to be able to evaluate how am I doing compared to the Lord's will and desire for my life? How is it going? And so that's what we've gone through. And so, again, going all the way back to the beginning, faith is that door opener. It's the key that unlocks everything the Lord has for us in the blessings and the promises and the understanding and the filling of us up with the Holy Spirit. Faith starts it all. And then that transitions to an understanding. Well, we know that he was faithful and accomplished things in the past, and he wrote us words of truth in the past. And so it transitions to hope. And I keep using that phrase, that absolute certainty of hope of where we're going in eternity to live with God. And so then Paul, of course, says the greatest of these three imperatives, faith and hope and love, is love. And we want to take a look at that because love is who God is, and love is what he shows to us, and it's love of God that allowed us to be created, the whole world to be created in the first place, and it's the love of God which sent the Son to suffer and die, which we just celebrated with communion, and it's the love of Christ that will allow him to be our great intercessor. When we stand before him, we've breathed our last breath in this earthly tent, and we stand before him, he will come in and intercede for us and say, I have paid the penalty and the price and the debt for every sin that that sinner has, has committed because they have put their faith in me. And it's out of love that we, are, we exist, and it's out of, faith, out of love that we are able to have faith, hope, and then experience the love of God as well as be able to show it ourselves. And so I want to just focus in on our last message here on love itself. And we could probably do 40 messages on love. In Scripture, there's plenty to go on, but this one will encapsulate what I believe the Scripture wants us to know about the condition of love, God's condition of love for us and our condition of love both for God and for those that God also loves that he calls into our presence with us. So, first off, we, we saw this last week. Pastor Chase did a wonderful job covering three additional uh, tests of our faith out of 1 John, and we saw that in chapters 4 and 5, that God, the essence of God is love. In fact, in chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, John says twice in that passage, God is love. It's a, a declarative statement that God is love. It's not just something he does. It's not something he prefers. It's who he is. It's the very essence 
of our creator, the very essence of our savior is love. He can't not be a loving God. He is love. And I want to look at this in a couple of different ways this morning. And I want you to all stick with me. I hope you'll all stick with me. I want to teach you three Hebrew characters or letters and two Hebrew words. Well, a third one, but we'll call that a bonus. Okay. A couple of things, but I believe are absolutely descriptive and non-accidental as to how God constructed the language. In fact, Hebrew, a lot, not all, but a lot of scholars believe that Hebrew was probably the original language spoken in the garden, original language that spoke all, was spoken all the way by the people until the Tower of Babel, okay? And you'll see that we have this original language and God constructed it. It's a beautiful language. It's awesome. If you haven't had a chance to really dig into it, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, I, had, I had the pleasure and pain of spending about four years in seminary trying to learn Hebrew, and I feel like I know this much compared to what I could know. Um, it's really a cool language in so many ways. I want to show you just a couple of things. First off, the, the letters of, in Hebrew, like ours, carry a semantic meaning, meaning we would look at it and we'd have a phonetic you know, expression of some letter in the alphabet. But unlike ours, the actual letter itself conveys like an image or conveys an icon or a semim or something that helps convey a, a message just by the shape and the factors of the letter. So we'll start with the first one that I want you to know, and this happens to be the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the Aleph. It's up there really, really big on your screen. I think that's 210 point font, I'm trying to make sure you can actually see what it is. And that's a modern version of it. The um, older version of the original versions that they find in ancient manuscripts is a little bit more in depth in terms of how it was, it was drawn. And it originally was supposed to in indicate or symbolize the head of an ox or an ox head. Okay. And because it was that, this strong beast of the field, it was intended, when you just looked at one single letter, that single letter was supposed to communicate strength, power, or headship. Everybody with me on this so far? One letter, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, and it communicates strength, power, headship, just by looking at the letter. It may not for you and I, because we didn't learn the language, but that's the intention behind the letter. Now, if we take a look at the second letter, the Bet, Okay, which, by the way, that's where we get our word alphabet or alphabet. Okay? You notice we don't get it from English. A and B doesn't sound like alphabet, and A, B, C doesn't sound like alphabet, and A to Z doesn't sound like alphabet. The aleph and the bet is the Hebrew, first two letters of the, or characters of the Hebrew language, aleph, bet, alphabet. You can see how that all came about. We still use that today. So this one, again, a little bit different in modern descriptions like you see on the screen, but it was intended to communicate something about a tent or a house, okay? And so it kind of looks like a tent or a house that's kind of got this opening um, and a symbol or a, of a place of security or safety, okay? You're supposed to see this and say, okay, that's where I go. That's, my, that's where I dwell. That's my place of safety. That's my place of security. Do you see these two things, okay? Ox, uh, aleph, ox head, strength. Bet, safety, security. If you put those two together, the aleph and the bet, you get a word. And it's a word you might be familiar with, even in English, even in the New Testament, because it's not transliterated into something else. It's ab, which means father. Like we also get abba, father, right? A little more tender variation of the word ab, or it's abba, okay? And so it represents the father. And you put these two ideas together. The strength and the head of the house is the father. The Hebrew language is communicating an a, a important aspect of God's plan and God's authority and God, the way he put things together. The strength of the house is the father. That's how he's designed the world. And again, if this is the original language, he built it that way to communicate something important. Okay? So, as I said, you probably already know this word a little bit. Ab means father. That's what it might look like. It, and by the way, I didn't say you're reading from right to left. No, that's my left, your right. But right to left, Hebrew goes from, left, from right to left. Okay, so the Aleph, Bet, that's why it's written that way. And so what the next thing I want to do is we'll take a slight detour here, and we're going to take a look at somebody else's name that you know pretty well that includes these two letters, which is 
Abram, or Abram, if you like, okay, who his name means Ab or Abram is high father, exalted father. Do you see how it kind of puts that together? Ab means father, and you add a little something extra to it to say, to give a descriptor, an adjective of what this father is. In this case, Abram means exalted or high father. Okay. Do you remember, we won't go there because we don't have enough time, but you remember in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is called Abram or Abram, okay, all the way until chapter 17. And then God says, you shall no longer be called Abram, but I'm going to call you Abraham. And when I say it, do you hear the change? There's one letter emphasized in that whole thing, and I'm not trying to do it on purpose. It's the only way I can really figure out how to say it. It's Abraham, okay? You see that ha that comes out. It doesn't have to be guttural with the extra little, you know, trills or whatever going on there. Abraham, so Abram becomes Abraham, okay? Ha, you got that hey going in there. In fact, that's what the letter is. And so if we look at what he, God the Father, added to Abraham's name, we see that he changes it from a exalted or high father, kind of a singular position. He adds, he calls it Abraham, calls him the father of a multitude. He says, you're no longer just the father of some small component of, of society. You are the father of a multitude. And I think most of us probably also recognize that God made a promise to Abraham that he would be a father of a multitude whose his offspring, his descendants would be more numerable than the sand of the sea or the stars of the sky. Okay? He says, I'm going to change who you are. Not just your name. We could have left his name the way it was, but he wanted his name to carry meaning. And he says to Abraham, the essence of who you are is now different than you ever thought it would be. At age 100 or age 99, Abraham gets this message you shall no longer be called Abram, but Abraham, and your whole essence of who you are is going to change. If you're sharp and, and notice, or if you know Hebrew well enough, you'll notice that God only added, forget the stuff at the bottom, those are vowel points which are not in the original, he only added this little letter here. So Aleph, Bet, and then the final Mem here, so Abraham, and then you got Aleph, Bet, Resh, the He, and the M. And so you've got Abraham. He added one letter that changed the essence of who Abraham and his life going forward would be. That hey changes everything. And we see that it's often referred to. Remember, the first two letters carried some type of symbolic meaning. Aleph, strength, headship. Okay? Bet means house. Okay? And so the he in Hebrew requires one to breathe out, just like our H's. Okay? So just like in, in that, you see, we got this, ha, huh, it's like what comes out. You can't breathe it in. Just like Eliza Doolittle and, you know, all that couldn't do it in My Fair Lady, you know, she couldn't, if you're saying it wrong, if you're not breathing out, right? So if you take the H's, you know, Henry Higgins says in Hertford, Hereford and Hampshire, or Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. You can't do that without huh, 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 breathing out. That was the whole point of the, mess, of the movie, if you have watched the movie, right? Or of that segment of the movie. So the whole point of the hey in Hebrew is to breathe something out or to show what's inside and let it come out to the world. Abraham or Abram, a, a good father, exalted father, becomes Abraham, a father of a multitude. So this hey is kind of important. What happens, I'm just going to just ponder here, what happens if I take Aleph and the bet, or I should say Aleph and the bet for you, Aleph and the bet, and I squeeze a hay in the middle of it. The father, this is the strength of the house, right? The father. And then you get a hay in the middle of it. Well, what happens if I add that hay to the middle of things? <clears throat> Any guesses at all? Look at the front cover of your bulletin. What's the big word in red? Love. The essence of the father is love. In Hebrew, he designed it to communicate this. Again, you don't have to be literate to know the whole thing. All you have to do is kind of look at these symbols and see strength, house, father, love. Now, I believe that God always intended the father of our houses, plural and human, that the father would demonstrate to his family love. 
He's the head of the house. He should be demonstrating love. He should be giving himself sacrificially to his wife and to his children. He should be, in the essence of who he is, love. But I believe that because of the way God constructed this, he also wanted to communicate something very specific to us about himself. He is the Father. He's our Heavenly Father. And guess what his essence is? Love. He communicated to it that to us in his words from the foundation of the inception of all language. God the Father is love. Now for us, reading in English, we, we skip that whole concept of who he is, not knowing what the word Ahab means, until we get to 1 John chapter 4. So way at the end of our New Testament understanding, we start to see in John 4, 8 and 4, 16, God is love. But this is not a new revelation for John. God is love, which has been communicated since the very first time the word ahab was used in Scripture. The essence of the Father is love. It's what, it, what he is. It's what he does. It's what comes out of him. It's his full and complete essence. Okay? So when we say God is love, it doesn't mean he, he shows love to some people. It means he can't help but be love. It's who he is. Now, for us in English, 21st century America, we tend to have connotations of the word love in things that really Scripture doesn't always try to communicate. Okay? We think about sexuality, we think about romance, we think about you know, lots of different broad range of meanings of love. And in the current world we live in, we try to act like love is accepting everything and anything anybody does. Well, I don't judge you. That's not what love is. Love communicates truth. Love shows when someone is saying or doing things wrong that are harmful to them, we point that out. Okay? The world currently hates when we point out sin hates when we point out transgression. They call the church, they call Christianity, they call God unloving for pointing out things that are harmful to people. But just like a parent with a child, and you got a hot stove or traffic and they're out playing in the front yard and there's traffic, it's not loving to let them do whatever they want and then go get injured. It's loving to show them boundaries. It's loving to show them the rules. It's loving to help them live a long life by following what the plan of the parent is, not the radical ideas of a four-year-old might be, right? Love is setting boundaries. Love is putting rules and parameters in place, and it's expressing and communicating those. God is love. That does, so that does not mean, as our current world says, everything we do is accepted by God. It means he loves us and he wants the very best for us. And we want to look at this concept here this morning. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed a little bit of a detour into Hebrew. I think it's cool stuff, okay, but we'll move on. All right, so as I just mentioned, uh, biblically, there's, there's a lot of words, and we use love in a lot of different ways. I love my car, I love my house, I love my wife, I love my kids, I love my job, I love my shoes, whatever it is. Right? I love it. I just love, love, love. Love is not the same. <laughs> love is not really the same in Scripture. Now, in the Old Testament, this Hebrew word ahab is not the only word that's used for love or translated in English love, but it's the most common, most predominant word in the Old Testament. And I would say most of the time, for, for ahab, it doesn't mean romance or sexual love. It does in the Song of Solomon, in a few other places, but most of the time it's more like Abraham loved his son. His only son that he loved was Isaac, that God called him to offer. <clears throat> Hopefully you see in that there's not a romantic sexual component to that love, and it's given all through the scriptures, you know, including in some of the verses that we'll take a look at here. It's just non-sexual. In the New Testament, the most common word that's used is agape, uh, the noun, or agapeo, the verb, is in Greek, Okay? It means love, and it's never used in any context in Scripture as being some kind of romance or sexual component to it. Okay? It's like God's love for the world. It's like God so loved the world, John 3, 16. That's clearly a love, a desire for the best things for the world, not for some type of romance or anything else. And it's just the word that's used there. So just clear that up because we get so confused. 
in our own language, the way we use these terms are not always consistent with the way the Bible uses those same terms. Okay, so point that out. Okay, and now you see in our text that we've been going through for six or seven weeks now is in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Now these three abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's also not a new revelation. We know from Jesus' own words about love being the greatest. So let's take a look at that. You probably are quite familiar with what it is. But in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 36, if I can get there quickly, I've lost some of my ribbons here. Um, Matthew 22. There it is. So you, you remember these words, and let me set the stage for you of what was happening here. So all through Jesus' earthly ministry, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those in charge in the temple, those in charge in Jerusalem, were always trying to trap him in his words. Let's ask Jesus a question that gets him in trouble. Like he can't respond in any other way. You know, in this case... Well, let me take a look here. So they had asked him some questions, and he shut them down. And then in verse 34, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees by their questions, they gathered together, had a little conference. How, what's the next question to ask Jesus? What can we do to trap him in his words? Okay, verse 35. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? You know, pick one. Which, one are you going, which ones are you going to not endorse because you're going to pick one and endorse that one over all others? And Jesus doesn't go to the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. He goes someplace else, completely off of where they were expecting him to go. And he says, here it is. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your mind. Yes, I'm emphasizing the word all. All love all with all that we are. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything. 30, for us, 39 books of the Old Testament and the five books of the Torah, the law, Everything hangs on two concepts, and neither one of them were written on the Ten Commandments. Okay, Neither one of them were written on the Ten Commandments, but these are the first and the second commandments. Everything else hangs on this. Let me prove that to you. Okay, So let's take a look at a couple of different places here in Scripture where we see this very thing described. First, we'll take a look at love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength whichever ones he was using there. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and this is one of these verses at least should sound pretty darn familiar to most of us, but I want you to see, because this is the instruction manual. Deuteronomy 6 is telling us how to love the Lord our God with all our mind, all our heart, all our strength, or all our soul, all, all of it. Okay? He's telling us how. If you're one of those, if you're that lawyer or you're those scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees standing there asking Jesus a question, he's telling you right here. He's telling all of us, go back to Deuteronomy 6 and find out how to love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, and all your strength. Verse 1, chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you that you may observe them in the land which you are uh, going to cross over and possess. Okay, that's fine. That's for Israel. Verse 2, that you may fear the Lord your God. Step one in loving God is to fear him. That means not be afraid and trembling in the corner. That means to have honor and reverence and awe and respect for the creator. Honor and respect for the Lord God of King of kings, Lord of lords in heaven, have fear of, of him. Trust him. Obey him. Honor him. Fear the Lord your God. That's how you love him. You fear him in that biblical way. Going on, pass the comma. To keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, 
you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. So you're supposed to fear God and love God and honor God and serve God and obey God all the days of your life. That's how you show him love. It's not just a one-time decision. It's a, I'm going to love the Lord my God, I'm going to fear him, and I'm going to walk with him, and I'm going to serve him all the days of my life, and if I have kids, I'm going to train my kids to teach, and train and teach them to love the Lord God the way he's taught me to love him. And if I have grandkids, I'm going to teach my grandkids how to love the Lord my God in the way that I love him, and he's called me to love him. Verse 3, therefore, O Israel, and I'll substitute, I think it applies here, O church, O individual believers, therefore, O Israel, be careful to observe that, that it may be well with you and that, it may be, uh, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord your God, uh, God of your fathers, has promised you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, you know this one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall love the Lord your God, and the words of our God shall be in your heart today. Okay? Sorry. Um, so these words I command are, it shall be in your heart today, verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. When you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We are to treasure the word of God. We put the word of God in our hearts. We speak about it. When people come over to our house, we teach it to our children. We teach it to our grandchildren. People who walk up to our house could possibly know that we serve and submit and love God. It should not be so difficult for someone to understand that the the word of the Lord is important to me, so much so that it's spoken of in the things that I do, places I go, the people I meet. The Lord God is in my heart, and his word is close and near, always being communicated to those who God also loves who he brings into my path and our paths. Okay. So that's what it looks like. That's the, I think that's the instruction manual, verse, first nine verses here of Deuteronomy 6, tells us how to love the Lord our God. Get his word and his love into our hearts, treasure it, fear him, and communicate to others, all the others around us, what this love looks like in our relationship with him and how it can... If it's transformed us, it can transform someone else if we tell them about him. All right, and then the second part, the second commandment, loving our neighbor as ourself, turn to, if you like, whichever way you turn to things, in Leviticus chapter 19, is where he starts to tell us, how do I love my neighbor? That that sounds so good, I could put a, a placard on my wall and say, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. What does that mean? What are the instructions for loving my neighbor as myself? Well, Leviticus actually is where that is quoted, and it tells us exactly what we are to do in that area. So, in Leviticus 19, starting in verse 9, he gives instructions of how to love our neighbor. Verse 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of the field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. I don't know how many of you farm, but you can put this into practice in other ways. And you shall not glean your vineyard, and you shall not gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. The poor and the stranger might need a little bit of help from us. And so we're called to make sure that we don't Holy consume everything that is a blessing for, that God has given us with and give, leave none of it for anybody else. God's instructions are make sure you have enough to give to someone else in need. Going on. Okay, how else can I love my neighbor? Verse 11. 
You shall not steal, because that harms somebody else, nor deal falsely, because that harms somebody else, nor shall you profane the name of your God, which harms you and other people. I am the Lord. You shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him, and the wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. Don't, don't hold back what is owed to somebody. Verse 14, you shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. Whatever we judge needs to be in the justice of the Lord. Not our own preferences, but in justice. We should be giving any and all preference to truth and to God's will because we don't want to injure somebody else with injustice. Okay. Uh, so you don't do injustice to the poor, nor honor the person uh, of the mighty. So you don't take the poor among us and put them in a different class, do different things to the poor because they're not as beneficial to you, and then do other more beneficial things to the wealthy or to the more affluent. We're supposed to treat everybody with the same love and respect and, and scales as, we would, as we'd want to be treated ourselves. We, treat our we love our neighbor as ourselves. So in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. I love that. It's just what I mentioned earlier. In righteousness, we need to judge our neighbor. That means, again, not accepting every single thing that they do and say, well, that's okay. God loves you anyway. It's telling them, no, I, I'm sorry, but I have to tell, call out something that's happening in your life. That sin is robbing you of the joy. That sin is robbing you of your relationship with God. And we need to point those things out. Don't rob your neighbor of the justice, the words of truth that we're called to speak to them when we see error and things that are harmful to them just because it, it's kind of painful to tell them the truth. We're called to do justice. Okay, verse 16, you shall not go about as a talebearer telling lies you, uh, among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother. We looked at that in 1 John. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, and you shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall sure, loving your brother is rebuking your brother as necessary in love, speaking God's words of truth. Okay. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So now we have two different ways in the Old Testament, which are very important and valuable to us. How do we love God? We love him with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength. We fear him. We reverence him. We obey him. How do we love our neighbor as ourself? We treat them first off and foremost how we want to be treated. If, we, if the situations were reversed, we would want to be treated just this way. And you may say, well, you know, if, if, I'm, if, if I was sinning, I may not want somebody walking up to me and say, well, you're a sinner. But you certainly would when you get to judgment day and you haven't had an opportunity to deal with your sin the way God wants you to. So the most loving thing we can do is tell them the truth in love. That's what we're called to do. So why is love for Paul and for Christ the greatest commandment? Because it's impossible Go look at the Ten Commandments. Go look at the other 603 laws of the Old Testament. Go look at them. How can you violate a single one of them and at the same time love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength? It doesn't work. And how can you treat your neighbor unjustly, unfairly, unlovingly without violating those commandments? Or turn around the other way. If I'm loving my neighbor, I'm clearly not stealing from my neighbor. If I'm loving my neighbor, I'm clearly helping him or her in whatever way is biblical and godly to help them with. Okay? I'm not sleeping with their wife. I'm not killing and destroying them. I'm not bringing false witness against them in a court of law or something. I am doing what God has called me to do. Love the Lord my God and love my neighbor as myself. And, and as Jesus says, all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commands. Do you see how that works? 
how Jesus got out of this test from a wise lawyer by saying, What's, what do you, how, do you cons- how do you rank the commandments? <laughs> I rank them in the order they were intended. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. All right. So, recognize here that love in Christ, by his own command, is the distinguishing characteristic of a believer. So, John 13, in this discussion at the, on his last day of life, Jesus comes and tells his disciples that he's giving them a new commandment. Okay, so, you see it on the screen. You can turn to John 13, not 1 John, but the Gospel of John. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, Jesus said it's a new commandment, but after what we've just reviewed, it doesn't sound all that new, does it? But he is saying to his disciples, I give you a new commandment. This is the most important thing I'm giving to you today, that you will love one another, as I have loved you. So now we've got some, uh, some real strong parameters on this love. How does Christ love you? He went to the cross, he suffered and died, he came down out of heaven, Philippians chapter 2, right? He gave up all of these abilities to say, hey, I'm God, I don't have to go down and die for people, but he gave it all up and he came and he lived and he taught and he went to the cross, he suffered and he died and he gave himself one as a ransom for many. So we're to love one another the way Christ loved us. If you feel that sense of how God loves you, how Christ has suffered and died for you, that's what we're called to do with other believers. A new commandment I give you, that you have love for one another. Just as I have loved you, Christ says, you shall show love one to another. And then he says, all will know, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you demonstrate or you show this love one for another. So just like in the Old Testament, You ought to have been able to go to a Jewish person's house and see that they love the Lord. They've got his word written on the doorpost. They have, they're talking about it and teaching it with everybody who comes in and they come in contact with. Love the Lord your God. And for a New Testament believer, all shall be able to see that I love God, he loves me, and I obey his command to love others. We should be demonstrating, I want the very best for you. This is not emotions. This is not romance. This is not anything that we deteriorate the word love into. This is, I want the very best for you. I'm willing to tell you the truth. I'm willing to help you when you're down. I'm willing to not let you get more highly exalted in your own mind than you ought to be. I'm willing to show love. And this is not touchy-feely. This is actual putting things into action helping others when they are in need. And all shall know that we are Christ. Whether they come to our house or they walk in the doors of our church, they ought to sense this is a place of genuine love. Not one that accepts every wrong thing that I do, but one that is loving enough to be in a same kind of relationship with me that God has demonstrated to me. God doesn't want me to bask and dwell in my sins And we shouldn't want people to bask and dwell in their sins either, in the love of Christ. All right. And then Galatians chapter 5, there's a couple of things in here. We'll close or get closer to a close here. Uh, Love expresses a true believer's faith, and by it, we fulfill this law of Christ. Christ, we saw, he established a new commandment in John 13. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 6, 13 through 15, and 22, we see... This love being expressed out as a law that Paul says, this is the law. If Christ has put a commandment on us as believers, I think we find its fulfillment here in in Galatians 5. So in verse 6, Paul writes, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision, which is obedience to the law, nor uncircumcision, which is freedom or liberty from the law, avails anything. What avails something? Faith working through love. Faith, we put that in the very, so faith was the first thing in our 
1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love. Faith works through love. It demonstrates love. That's the law of Christ. That's what he's called us to. And then jumping forward here, um, if I can get there. All right. So I'm going to actually start in verse 14. I'm not sure that's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Verse 13. Let's do that. So he says in verse 13, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity to serve your own flesh. But through faith, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in this one word. Yes, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, you shall be consumed by one another. The whole, this whole book is summed up in one word. Love. You shall love the Lord your God, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't do that, and he's talking to the church, you're going to bite and devour one another. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very healthy for the church to be biting and devouring one another. And then further on in Galatians, a verse, again, you're probably quite familiar with, the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23 Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and guess which one tops the list? Love. The fruit of the Spirit. You have nine fruits of the Spirit that Paul lists there in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The first and most constant and most prevalent fruit that every Christian is called to bear is the one that tops the list. Love. I hope you have a much greater, fuller understanding of what that means today. Loving God, loving our neighbors, loving our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Okay. Now, we'll close with this, and that is the love chapter, as so many people love to refer to as. See how we use that word love? Um, in 1 Corinthians 13, where we get all this topic and study, 1 Corinthians 13 is that chapter, and I bet you a lot of you had this read at your weddings or have been to a lot of Christian weddings where it was, was read. One thing to take note of here is that marriage, husbands and wives are not listed or not given or not referenced in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians 13 at all. He's talking to the church in this whole section, 12, 13, and 14. Paul is giving instructions on a healthy church, not a healthy marriage. That was back in chapter 7. Okay. Here in chapter 13, he's talking about a healthy church demonstrating love for one another. So as Jesus says, you know, I'll paraphrase, it's really pretty easy to love those who love you back. It's really easy. When they're good to you, you be good to them. That's not what 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about at all. It's talking about loving the unlovable, loving the challenging, loving the difficult. And so... I'm calling this, this is my word or phraseology, not the scriptures, but love is purified in the crucible of long-suffering. Let me help you with that if it doesn't make immediate sense to you. Okay? Love has got a lot of things going on. And my love, or your love, let's say, let's take the, some of the best, your love on your wedding day hopefully was a, you know, one of these nice pure experiences. You love them, they love you. It's, you know, it's easy to Show love on that. But love is purified like a, a you know, gold or a fine metal in a, in a refiner's fire. It's purified as things intensify, as things heat up. Okay? And so a crucible is something that can withstand a great deal of intense heat so that the material inside the crucible can melt and get all kinds of you know, liquidy things going on in there and even impurities rising to the top and can be skimmed off the top. Okay. Love is purified in the crucible of long suffering, meaning it's easy to love when you're not having to suffer for it. But your love is perfected and purified when we suffer long with the difficult, suffer long with the unlovable, suffer long with the challenging people in our walk, in our life. Let me read through this in, with that in mind. Verses 4 through 8, or sort of the first phrase of 8. Love suffers long, long-suffering. It's willing to endure all that the, uh, the object of our love or the beloved that we have 
all that they have to give us, we're going to suffer right along with them. doesn't mean we accept everything they do. I've covered that multiple times this morning. It means we suffer with them. And while we're suffering with them, our love is kind. And our love does not envy what they have, because that would be covetousness. That would be unhealthy for us. We don't, we don't covet what they have, whether it's good or bad, sinful or, or not. We don't, we don't envy what they have. Love does not parade itself. Look how good I am, because love is always trying to build up the other, not build ourselves up. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely to the challenging, to the unlovable, to the ones who are grating on our emotions and our spirit, but love is the crucible in which is, or, or, or it, long-suffering is the crucible in which love is perfected, right? And so it's not behaving in these ways. It doesn't rejoice in the beloved's iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. Right? Bears all things. It's willing to endure and bear all things. Believes all things. Believes the best things. I believe even though the person that I need to show love to has stumbled again for the 45th time today. I can show them love again, and I'm going to believe that next time things will get better for you. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. You see, we can use this for weddings and marriages, because hopefully that's the one place where this should be easy to do it. But we have lots and lots of people in the kingdom of God who need our love, and we have to suffer long with them and show them kindness and show them grace and show them truth and show them the things that God wants to reveal to them for their own good. We want the best for them. It's kind of described, that agape love is, is described as this undefeatable desire for the very best for the person without expecting or demanding anything in return from them. That's agape love. That's what Christ did for us, and that's what we're called to do for those he calls us to love. Want, without being defeated, the very best for someone else. And so, God's timing is awesome and perfect. Never planned it this way. But tonight, regardless if you're coming here for harvest party and trunk or treat, or you got your other things going on in your own house. We have got a world that is reveling in darkness and sin and satanic overtones over everything that's going on out there. We have an opportunity tonight, certainly on this property, to see hundreds of people come onto this property who in many ways we might classify as unlovable or so sinful I don't want to have anything to do with them or something happening, we as a church and as believers tonight have a great opportunity to show the love of Christ, to demonstrate how much he loves them, to demonstrate the truth, maybe not confront them, a six-year-old, you know, whatever, on their choice of costume, but we have a choice to show them, God, Jesus loves you so much. God loves you. The word of God tells us that he loves you. This is a place where we can communicate to a world that is may desire to come onto our property for the very first time, we have a chance to demonstrate the love of Christ. And I would ask that we would, if you're participating in this event, please pray in advance that the Lord will give you words of wisdom, that the Lord will give you opportunity to share. Pray that salvations will happen on this piece of real estate on this October 31st night. Right now, start praying that something miraculous and powerful and life-changing and kingdom-changing will happen because we have decided to share the love of Christ on a dark and, what I would think, disgusting night that the enemy wants to revel in. But we can change that, and we can do it tonight. And so I'm going to pray now and just invite you to think and consider, how can the Lord use me before the sun breaks tomorrow? Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would redeem this day, you'll redeem the time, you'll redeem, Lord God, all of the wickedness that exists in my heart, in all of our hearts, Lord. Help us to, in love and in fear, honor you, treasure you, reverence you, Lord God. Speak words of love, speak words of encouragement, speak words of truth 
to those that you bring into our relationship, Lord. Those in the church who certainly deserve your love and our love, Lord. But tonight, let's take this special opportunity. I pray your Holy Spirit would be moving and active and powerful in reaching lost souls for the kingdom. I pray that you will use us, Lord. Use this church. Use your people to bring a message of hope, a message of truth, a message of salvation in Christ's name alone through our activities of reaching the lost world under your power, under your grace, and under your influence through the, through the name and power and authority of Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. So glad you came. We have prayer teams up front. They will show you love in their prayer, so come on up. And uh, if you're coming tonight, we're looking forward to see you then. Lord bless.